So uh, we read, we are live now. Hello there, everyone, and welcome to our live stream on the sound and recording page. Uh, I have with me Richard Devine. We are very honored to have him here. Um, first of all, we would like to know if you can hear and see us properly. So if you could just quickly write in the comments, if you can hear us and see us, that would be great. We'll just wait a few moments if everything everything checks out properly. Hopefully you guys can hear me. See, yes. Oh, the microphone sounds good. The picture as well. Oh, cool. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Cool. Yeah, so it seems to check out. So um, I would say let's start. What do you say, Richard? Are you, are you ready as well? I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Very, nice. Very nice. So welcome again to our sound and recording live stream. Um, I hope you're all healthy and well in these crazy times. And um, yeah, I'm your host for tonight, for this session. Um, I am Martha Barr. I'm an author for sound and recording um, for several years now. And I'm also maybe known to some of you as Panic Girl. I'm a musician and sound designer and audio engineer myself. And today I have uh, the honor of um, welcoming Richard Devine with me. Thanks so much for taking the time. It's so cool. Oh, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, Richard Devine, just a quick, I tried to keep it short and sweet. Um, he is a sound designer, an electronic artist, and composer, musician, audio programmer, and his credit list is just reading like my personal dream job list, to be honest. Um, he has worked with so many cool companies. I will um, just give a quick overview. Um, he worked with audio companies like Native Instruments, Arturia, Eventide, uh, DRM tools, Isotope. I have to read a little bit, qu uh, a little bit of of the company names here because there are so many. I, I <laughs> too. I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just amazing. Digidesign, Ableton, Korg, Clavia, Access Virus. Um, but not only audio com companies, also other companies like um, he did commercials for sound effects, um, um, and uh, yeah different sounds for them like BMW, Lexus, HBO, Nike, Coke, Sprite, Dodge, Xbox, Gi Jaguar. Then also um, he worked on gaming, gaming sound soundtracks, sound effects like uh, for Doom 4, for Cyberpunk, that's so cool, Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, he also worked for the Konami gaming division. He also worked uh, virtual on virtual reality um, music, um, and he's also has released several full-length albums on um, labels like Warp Records, Schematics, Schematic, sorry, uh, Sublight Records, and remix artists like FX Twin, Mike Patton. Wow! And I'll just stop here because I could go on for like an hour with yeah, you don't have to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing. It's, it's so many interesting projects you have here, and that would lead me to my first question: um, What was the most interesting project for you? If you even could pick one, I guess it's pretty hard. But um, or what? Which one was the most rewarding, challenging? Um, which one did you learn the most? Do you have one project maybe you could pick? Oh, wow. There's, yeah, there's so many um, that I've worked on. And I, just by nature, I'm one of those people that like to do or work on projects where I've never done something before, or it deals with sound and technology in a way that I've, you know, um, not dealt with. So um, those kind of projects I tend to gravitate towards. So um, and they can be challenging and for, force you to be in a position where you might feel really uncomfortable, where you're like, oh my God, I might screw this whole thing up <laughs> um, in a really bad way. But I feel that um, that it's forced me to learn new skills and kind of get me out of my comfort zone um, and kind of, kind of pushes you to that next level in a way. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, I'd say like some, some, projects that I've worked on in the past that 
to me, I felt were really interesting. Where I think some of the stuff I've been doing with Google, a lot of the ambisonic virtual reality, 360 audio stuff that I did with them for um, Daydream and mm -hmm. then Google Earth VR. I'm not sure if any Bonnie's tried uh, or any of you that have virtual reality based systems, either like the Oculus or HTC Vive. Um, I worked with them on Google Earth where I did a lot of the ambisonic um, recordings for different locations around the planet where if you were at a, you know, the Grand Canyon or if you were in a field or at an ocean or an open field or in a forest, I captured and mixed all of those recordings and um, while you travel around the earth. And then also I created a lot of the ambisonic um, sounds uh, as well as the user interaction sounds with the controllers if you're switching around the menus and selecting different items. Um, so it was, a, yeah, it was a very interesting project. I had never worked with ambisonic audio before, never worked in virtual reality, never worked with Unity, uh, which was what we did a lot of the building in. Um, so I learned a lot of things on that project that uh, normally I probably wouldn't have uh, even got, you know, had I not been presented with uh, any of those um, um, issues with putting all that together, I wouldn't have learned any of that stuff. So it was a really fascinating uh, project to work on. And, you know, to experience it in the end was mind blowing. I remember when we, imagine. we first tried Google Earth and me and my wife were like, let's go to our house in virtual reality. Let's see if it, what it looks like. So we typed in our address and you can fly with the controllers and zoom in. So you type <laughs> in, you just type in any location on earth you want to go. It's just like uh, Google Earth for the uh, web browser, but you know, uh, but it's in virtual reality. So you see everything. Oh, wow. And we went to our neighborhood, we walked down our street and we were just like, wow, this is absolutely mind blowing. How did they capture all of this data? You know, the first question we got was, you know, you're, you're thinking it's kind of scary, actually, that they've captured all this in such detail, um, you know, where you can see everything at every angle. And I remember we were like, let's sit up in that tree in front of our uh, front of our bedroom. And we, we were looking, sitting up, we, there's this really, really big tree in our front yard. There was no way you could climb to the top of it. But in the VR and the VR experiences in Google. <laughs> you can you can see your house from any angle. You can be in any tree that you want. You can be, you know, That's 100. Crazy. So we were seeing views of, of things and we were like, wow, we need to clean our gutters out. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, the technology now is just fascinating. Um, so, so just to, you know, to be a part of something like that um, was really, really interesting um, for all the people that, got to experience that and that, that, that have VR based systems, you know, um, to create this sort of like virtual world that you can explore. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really fascinating. Amazing. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. What gear did you use for your work for the audio part of, of this whole project? That was uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what uh, equipment did you use? Did, did you, I guess you recorded many of the, the places yourself? um the sound yes. of the and how did you process it um or is it too does it's, it take uh, too long to explain <laughs> no no it's uh um we used we used several different ambisonic microphones we used the sennheiser ambio uh mm -hmm. VR, vr mic um i also used a company um soundfield tsl soundfield the st450 uh ambisonic um mic it's a it's a very compact portable mic microphone um, that has a decoder box on it. And I think it's one of the only um, systems out there that lets you do mono to stereo to surround to full uh, ambisonic monitoring from the box. The box will do all the decoding for you in real time. Right. You can preview and listen because a lot of the um, VR packages out there or VR mics, they you, you have to take your four channel um, ambis uh, Amazonic record and recordings and then have software convert that to an Amazonic B file that you can then later use um, or preview on a, you know, headphones um, playback system. So with this system, what's really nice about it is I can just be out on location anywhere and be able to kind of test and listen to how it's going to sound before. Oh, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. it's very, very expensive system, kind of scary to take out. I was kind of worried. It's like, 
I think eight or nine thousand dollars. It's not cheap. Oh um, wow! And I remember you better not drop it. <laughs> I'm scared that taking it out and uh, and it would in conditions where there was a lot of moisture when there was a lot of rain. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I remember doing a lot of recordings in Florida. We were I was taking the mic out and uh, my setup in, in a kayak and you know the swamps and stuff and where the humidity was really really bad and during some thunderstorms. Uh, the microphone would definitely start to kind of, um, it, it, there's, it, it, it wouldn't work as well with, with high humid con conditions would start to mm -hmm. come off and crackle. So it was definitely some points where I was concerned that I was ruining <laughs> this thing, but, um, for the most part, I was able to capture everything. And, um, but yeah, it was really, really fascinating. There was a lot of, uh, problems uh, that I thought were going to be really easy to tackle. I thought they'd be really easy things like wind, for instance. Mm -hmm. We spent months and months trying to get just the wind, uh, capturing gentle sounds of a breeze in an ambisonic uh, environment. Like either it was too busy, there was too much rustling, or the um, you know it was really really difficult. I had to actually resort to using procedural based software that generated wind sound so I could actually control the rate of how much wind what happened oh, right. and also crickets. We had a problem with trying to capture um, the perfect recording of crickets. You would think that that would be, that might be easy, right? So mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I probably went to 50, 60 different locations to record different crickets, different, you know, I spent months. Oh, and wow. Months. Never could get the right amount of crickets that they wanted for this one scene in Daydream. And so what I did was I used a pure data patch that generated uh, different insect sounds. So I synthetically created the sounds of crickets so I could control the rate of how much the cricket would play. And then I created a multi-channel version of that patch that would play uh, in surround on my surround Genelec system. So then I had this patch that would play maybe one cricket on the right speaker just for a couple seconds and one on the left, one in the center speaker, then one on the rear. Uh, so I could perfectly control um, in a, also in a completely isolated environment uh, because another problem issue was noise pollution. So mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I was having a lot of issues, you know, there would be motorcycles, uh, distant highway noise, airplanes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, other animals too. There were things where I was like, well, yeah, I'm getting some great cricket sounds, but I'm also getting all this other stuff like frogs and birds and, uh, you know, all this other stuff that would be, it's almost nearly impossible to remove, to remove any of that. Um, mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so I would have to sometimes create some of these things synthetically and isolate those sounds and then either re-record them in an ambisonic uh, setting in the studio or, create them, you know, like I said, synthetically, and then mix them uh, later in post uh, with Reaper. I had a, I have a host of different tools and stuff and plugins that I would use that you could take a, like a mono signal and convert that to a, an ambisonic mixing file that you mix in a, you know, a spatial sphere and stuff like that. So there's, there's lots of different ways. It was just a lot of thinking about things differently to achieve the exact result to make sure that um, the experience, what you're hearing and what you're seeing in that virtual reality space was believable. I guess that's mm -hmm. the, that the most important thing is that all the elements had to feel just right. The balance of everything had to feel right. Um, and it also had to feel believable. And that was really difficult. I thought those things would be um, much easier than, than I thought. But then mm -hmm. when I actually started digging in, I was like... But, I, but it sounds very interesting and very uh, also very challenging. Mm -hmm. I think you... I guess you also enjoy the challenge behind your projects and yep. you seem to be very free. You So you didn't only had to use your field recordings. You could also use your patches and combine all those, all those tools. And I think that makes it very, yeah, that's, that's your unique creation then in the end. So that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, and speaking of your interesting project, is there anything, in this whole list of dream jobs, is there anything left for you? What you, some dream project you would like to do, still? Um, you know, I'd like to. I've worked only on two films um, over the years, and uh, yeah, I'd love to do some film 
more film work. The last film I worked on, I collaborated with an artist, BT, Brian Trance, who uh, on this film called Look, that was directed by Adam Rifkin, which was a really interesting, strange film that was all shot on surveillance cameras in a, in a town. So it was catching all these weird situations between these people in the town. And um, we collaborated on that score, which was really cool. We, we decided to do everything to, to design the entire score just with field recordings based on the environments for each one of the, per each scene for all the characters uh, in the film. So we, you know, we're like recording, there was like an office scene where we recorded all these like printers and fax machines and scanners. And then we, we turned those into like micro rhythms where those became the actual score of the, you know, where the sound design actually was actually part of the, the musical score. Uh, right. So we did all these like really interesting things that we were just trying to experiment with, um, you know, kind of approaching the film score comp and from a completely different angle rather than just taking the typical approach that maybe most composers would, um, mm -hmm. you know, you know, orchestra or orchestral instruments were just more typical instruments. We wanted to kind of go at it, go at it from a completely different angle and just, to, just to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. and luckily, Adam, the director was really, uh, he was on board with it and, and let us go wild. And I thought it was really cool. It was a great, uh, it was a really fun experience working on that. And, you know, hopefully at some point down the road, I'd, I'd be able to do that again. And, you know, who knows, mm -hmm. maybe the next Blade Runner movie or something. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that would be amazing. That would be a dream, you know. And that would be a dream. Yeah. We did an, an incredible job on that. And, um, but it'd be just something really fun, I think, um, to to uh, tackle something like that. So up. if somebody listens here <laughs> who has something to do with the next place run, <laughs> Richard is maybe available. <laughs> you never know. Uh, <laughs> you never know. You never know. That's true. Um, and another great project I read about was the Jaguar, um, the new Jaguar, Jaguar electric car. You did the whole sound design package for. Could you tell us something more about that? Maybe? Yeah, that um, that was a very challenging job. Um, that was actually about four or five years of working with them um, to get to the point to where we actually released the car out to the world. I had worked on several pro prototype cars with them um, since about 2013. So uh, we were prototype they were prototyping new technologies and in each year we were doing a lot of back and forth testing trying to figure out how we were going to tackle the situation they were they're at a point where they're trying to transition from combustion based vehicles to there was that period there where they were doing hybrids and then now they're fully trying to move into all electric vehicles and with that before you even get to the stage of releasing that there's a lot of testing in the background and um, trial and errors and things and we tried lots of different stuff to see what would work and what didn't work. And um, that was a very challenging job that, um, and that of course I'd never worked uh, in, I, I, I couldn't ask any of my friends like, hey, I've been asked to design sounds for an actual car. Have you done this before? <laughs> um, something completely different, I guess, yeah completely foreign, completely alien concept to me. Um, you know, I remember thinking like, wow, I, this is going to really uh, take some, take some heavy thought into how we're going to even approach this. And I remember it because I'd worked quite a bit with some video game companies like Microsoft games and Sony um, Epic and Bungie. I worked on quite a few titles doing sound design for a lot of their games over the years. So I was pretty familiar with a lot of the gaming tools like wise and F mod and um, so my approach was to kind of take what I learned working with some of those companies. Um, there was, I think, a, an FMOD example of a driving simulation example that I used kind of as a base model to kind of just test out the mechanics of how I would understand how to build an engine sound, even just through samples first. So it was just like, well, let me just figure out, you know, the relationship of acceleration, deacceleration with a gas pedal, um, you know, load limit of how many people in the car would cause more weight, how that would change the sound, like all these different factors that would, wow, yeah. mm -hmm. um, there's all these sort of things you'd have to think about, um, especially when it's, 
you have to design something that's going to be out there in the real world. It's a bit different than when you're designing something for a video game, but I didn't have any other place to look to as far as how to even model something. So um, th I think, yeah, FMOD was my first go-to, and then uh, I took their, their example, their driving simulation example, game example, and then I built, uh, I built a synthesizer and reactor mm -hmm. that basically emulated this. It took that idea, but I went even further. Instead of it just using samples, my, my synth, you could use samples and synthesis um, mixed together to create this, um, this sort of like EV electrical engine type sound. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, oh, nice. And, um, which, well, what was great about that is because I was, um, I was tasked with trying to come up with a new sound. They didn't want something that sounded like a combustion-based engine. They didn't want mm -hmm. it to sound like a mechanical engine, a gas-based engine. So they wanted it to sound futuristic. Mm -hmm. And brief, uh, they sent me several uh, examples of like the, the Star Wars space pod racers and um, oh, cool. <laughs> the Tron light cycle bikes and stuff like that. Oh, really nice. Cool, mm -hmm. Really cool stuff. So they definitely wanted it to sound, um, you know, modern, classy, mm -hmm. modern, um, elegant. You know, I've also had to really, really stick within the uh, the brand. The brand's very important to them. I was working with their marketing team who wanted to make sure that whatever I was creating was, you know, in in line with what they wanted the to represent the car to represent sound like. So it was very tricky because um, the whole reason why we even had to design the sound in the first place was because of a legislative law that got passed in the United Kingdom that all electric vehicles had to emit a sound at a specific distance so that people that um, have hearing disabilities and who uh, may not hear very well are also people that are blind, who can't see vehicles in a park. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they had quite a few lawsuits in the United Kingdom because of these, like the Prius and some of these other electric vehicles like Tesla and stuff, they, you, do, you can't even hear them coming in a parking lot if you're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, even my wife. It's dangerous, actually, yeah. Mm. Very dangerous. So they changed the laws, um, you know, which is uh, completely makes sense. I remember when I got in my, uh, my mother-in-law, her hybrid, her Honda hybrid Civic, and um, I've been driving combustion-based vehicles my whole life. So when I got into the hybrid and when it, it, it's one of those cars that shifts to economy mode. So you can be, it's kind of a, it'll shift to electrical mode. And then it always kind of freaks me out. I think the car's lost power or it's, it's yeah. you, know, you know, and because you don't hear anything, there's no more vibration that you feel through the steering wheel. Um, so it's a very weird sensation to, if you're a person that's used to that stuff, even for the driver, um, you take all those, those, those senses away, your, your, kind of, your brain started gets, it's confused. It's, it's trying to triangulate and locate all that information that it's usually used to getting. And it's not there with an electric vehicle. So mm, um, even for the driver, it can be, um, kind of a strange experience. So, um, you know, at the, at the other end for, for pedestrians on the sidewalk, who can't hear it coming, I, you know, like, like I said, it's, it's definitely uh, um, an issue that they had to address. So that's why we had to, that they came to me in the first place was like, we've got to tackle this problem. Uh, the legislative law has set these guidelines that the sound has to meet. It has to be a specific loudness, it has to sit in a specific frequency range and it has to project at a specific distance through uh, cut through, you know, environmental noise and wind noise. And there's all these other factors that we had to adhere to, to, to make make sure the sound was um, meeting all those the, the meeting mm -hmm. all the criteria, so it was very challenging to do that and also uh, craft it into something that sounded futuristic and meet all the branding divisions expectations. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, that's that's that was very challenging. And and of course, me here trying to figure out the mechanics of how yes. I'm going to. Uh, make all this work was the most challenging part um, because there was an interior sound that would play in the car to the driver that was different than the exterior EV engines oh, right. mm -hmm. outside because the speakers in, in the inside of the car uh, are different than the speakers that are on the outside of the car. There's four other that are on the outside that are that have a completely different uh, frequency response. What that means is just 
you know, the range of frequencies that they output was very limited compared to what you could play in the car. The car had mm -hmm. sub, there were subwoofers in the doors and in the bottom of the car. So uh, I was Crazy. able to lower uh, bass frequencies and stuff like that, but the, the outside speakers weren't able to, to reproduce that. So we had some, had to do a lot of uh, tweaking to get the sound uh, believable and make it sound full and uh, and have uh, and figure out ways to add weight to the sound if that makes sense um, mm -hmm. totally. <laughs> uh, it's very tricky yeah it was very um, it was definitely a stressful job I would have to say it's not a normal mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, with so many criteria you have to meet and uh, yeah that's that's crazy it's yeah. but you you managed it and uh, yeah um, I, I now I uh, only have to uh, afford a Jaguar <laughs> to yeah, experience it. Was, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, yeah, when it's not only the EV, uh, you know, the, the electrical engine sound, I actually designed all of the internal sounds as well. So all the, the user interface sounds. Yeah, UI sounds, the in system navigation, uh, touch screen, all the touch screen button sounds, all, you know, the um, GPS. Uh, even the left and right indicator blinkers sounds I had to make. I uh, actually made those on the, I, remember, I think I made those on the uh, Yamaha Montage FMX. So I was using a lot of the FMX mm -hmm. engine um, to create a lot of those sounds because a lot of, uh, I feel like FM synthesis cuts through. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, as far as like creating those types of sounds, it works really, really well when you're working. Uh, if you're in an environment that's really noisy or there's a lot of background stuff. And um, I was using a lot of physical modeling type sounds, but more of the sounds that I think that um, proved to be uh, much more effective with, with that to be played in those type of environments where it was more of FM synthesis based stuff. So I was using the FMX engine and the montage, which is to me one of the most advanced FM uh, synthesizers out on the market. I feel like oh, it's really? mm -hmm. a hidden, uh, it's like a hidden gem inside the montage. I, um, I know a lot of people that might look at the montage and be like, oh, that's just an, the next motif keyboard. But um, that FMX engine in there is extremely powerful. Um, and you can do some pretty strange, wild things with it. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, um, make very um, clean, beautiful, uh, you know, sort of pristine, expensive sounding FM. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I have to try it. it. I, call, I call it. Um, but uh, yeah, it worked perfect for that. It was, uh, it was like a perfect um, uh, marriage of, of technology. I used a lot of, I also used the Kima system by uh, Symbolic. Um, oh, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, I used quite a bit of their, uh, I use that system a lot for re the resynthesis. So um, there was a uh, part of what I wanted to do was I did what was called an engine analysis study. So I looked at, I looked in the past of all the previous vehicles, the previous Jaguar vehicles, mainly the uh, four door sedans. Cause the I pace, the car that I was working on was basically a family car. So I was more interested in looking at um, the cars that they created you know, three to four or five years ago. So I wanted to record those engine sounds and then analyze those engine sounds in the computer and, and do basically an engine study and then find the correlation and find out what the commonality was. Um, and because they really wanted me to capture what they called the purr of the Jaguar. That was the, uh, that kept coming up in a lot of the meetings. And so I had to kind of figure out and understand what that was. Mm -hmm. and, and that really was just a, uh, really came down to the harmonics of the engine, of how the, the, the engine was humming at different RPMs, so whether it was an idle position or accelerating up to, you know, um, you know, full blast on the highway, I, would, I recorded these engines and then kind of analyzed them, and then I resynthesized these recordings. Uh, so taking an acoustic recording, then resynthesizing that in the Kima system to kind of um, recreate synthetically with sine waves. So I would take a little bit of what I, the data from those recordings, and then I took that information and, and kind of, um, how, to, how can I explain it? Um, 
harmonically took that data and recreated mm -hmm. a synthesized version of that mm -hmm. with synthesizers so that I could give them something. There was like one link to the past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the customers wouldn't be, they wouldn't hear this sound and be like, oh, that's, that doesn't sound Completely like. Completely new and totally different. Mm -hmm. Right. I wanted to, there to be some trace of the past in the new sound, mm -hmm. but it's still some tradition yeah. mm -hmm. from the tradition so that there was some familiar, you know, clarity with, uh, the brand and super um, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was. Uh, yeah, it was. It was lots of nights of scratching my head trying to figure out how to. <laughs> I can't imagine. Yeah. Yeah, wow. it's, it's a lot of people think I just play with synths and. <laughs> day, I think I, one can see with with the with all your um with everything is online or your album your la latest album that is it's very much. Yeah, you you use so many different tools, and uh, one can hear that you really like getting into very complex uh, sounds and rhythms. And and yeah, it's for me, it's like you're communicating off often with maybe an alien <laughs> life form. Or um, <laughs> yes, it's, it's it's crazy good. I love it. I love it. also the the latest album of yours. Maybe we could um, talk a little bit about that one if sure. you would like to. Um, yeah, I read, um, because you also, I think many are waiting a little bit for the modular part of Richard Divine, <laughs> um, because many know the pictures of your massive modular system in your studio as well. And I read that you used for your um, latest album, uh, mainly your modular, not only, I think also, uh, the Nord, Nord yes. here. That's correct. And that it took you quite a long time to um, to set up your modular cases to play different roles um, in the composition. Maybe if you would like to elaborate a little bit on that one, that's super interesting. Yeah, um, that is, let me see, where do I even begin? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I wanna say right around 2000, I want to say 2015, 2016, um, and prior to this, you know, we, 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 you know, when we were saying at the beginning of the, the interview that it, you know, when I was starting to buy, when I bought my first two systems from Dofer in 2005, I'd been slowly building up and buying more cases. I started out with two cases in in the beginning, as most people who get into your Iraq will probably totally know what I'm talking about, but you know, they say, okay, I'm not, I'll be fine with one case or two cases. And then, you know, uh, uh, six months goes by and you filled it up already. And then I was like, all right, I'll buy one more case, you know, and, and then I filled that the last up. one. Yeah, exactly. This is it. I don't need any more, you know, and then, um, and uh, yeah, so it just kept on going because it was, you know, by that time, it, the, men, the, the amount of manufacturers that were starting to come out at the time started to multiply and then there were more and more and then it's this exponential curve started to drive up and there was just so much stuff happening and, um, and it was really exciting um, for me um, being there right at the beginning seeing all this happen um, and you know we talked earlier a little bit how I you know met a lot of these early Eurorack manufacturers from the beginning even before they started designing Eurorack stuff like Tony Rolando from Make Noise um, Dan from Formas and Scott from Harvestman and uh, my friend Mike at Livewire and Peter Ganotter from Plan B. These were some of the first people on the scene. Um, Gurr from Tip Top and, um, you know, before that it was just Dieter Dofer and Analog Solutions and Woa Schwayman with some of his modules. And back when I started buying stuff, that was all that was available. So my system just comprised of those modules. Um, you know, 80, 90% Dofer stuff, couple of analog solution modules, and then a few sporadic Schwayman things here and there. Um, yeah, there really wasn't much, not, not even, you know, <laughs> a tenth of what we have available today. We have, um, you know, thousands of different manufacturers and, and options these days. And it's, uh, it's like almost daunting when you go to like modular grid and you're like, Oh my God, look at the list of all these people that make stuff. And, um, it was yeah. probably more easy in, back in the days to start, start off because it was just, you just pick maybe depth for a case that's <laughs> and yeah. that's it. And you don't have to choose from so many manufacturers. Yeah. That's amazing. It, it, it was, it was for me, what, got me really fascinated with Eurorack because I think what might be uh, what 
some people might not know about me is that, you know, your your rack, uh, you know, it's just, like I said, it's just another form of modular, a modular based system. Um, I had been using modular systems and since I was 17, 16 years old, um, you know, my first synth was more modular like synth was the ARP 2600. And uh, so from that point, I started to buy other modular based synths that were available to them. This was in the early nineties. Um, so when I was building up my studio, then um, I, I was able to get some pretty rare things like the Electro Comp EML 101 and the EMS Synthi, uh, AKS. Oh, wow. um, I had that, made music for that for about six, seven years. That was one of my favorite portable modular uh, synths that I would take. Uh, my mom used to own a restaurant uh, and I was the cook at her her restaurant I used to take my synthy in the kitchen and put it on top of the freezer and in between cooking, you know, oh, really? <laughs> back there I had my headphones and I'd had an R8 drum machine that would run into the synthy and I was, con you know, conducting all these experiments and just, and during the early nineties, I was really, really kind of, it was like, um, it was kind of like class for me. It's like an edu it was a really educational period. I, I, I always say this in interviews and features, but I, I tell people all the time, I'm always a student for life. I'm not really a master of anything. I'm just a constantly a student in school learning. And I take the same approach that I did back then, you know, 20 years ago that I do now. I'm just using the technology that's available now to me. Um, and back then, you know, there wasn't your Iraq, um, you know, 91 or 92 when I was buying some of this stuff, I was just using what I was buying at pawn shops. And uh, I was very fortunate that I was able to buy some of these things because they were really, really cheap because no one wanted these things back then. I know that might sound wild, but in the early 90s, I remember going to some of the pawn shops here in Atlanta. I buy Jupiter 6. I bought my Jupiter 6 for like $300, 400 oh, really? um, <laughs> $2,600 I bought for $250. I mean, People oh, wow. joke about I, I'm paying I'm paying I was paying Behringer prices for <laughs> uh, for you know classic vintage things that people didn't want to use because at that time in the early '90s these synths were uh, trying to emulate realistic things like the TR808 drum machine. I remember buying all the XOX um, you know 909 303s, all that stuff. I got for really really cheap. No one wanted that stuff. Um, and a lot you of still have all those machines. Or? Have, I still have my TB 303 that I bought oh, wow. in high school when I was 17 years old. I, I still have that. Um, and like I said, I didn't pay anything for those, but those, those were the things that were available to me at, at the secondhand shops that people were getting rid of for next to no money. And those were the things that I learned on. And I was, like I said, I was extremely fortunate enough that I had that opportunity to buy a lot of that stuff for cheap and had the time to invest to to learn that stuff because it really really taught me a lot um you know i don't know if i'd be here today had i not uh gotten my hands on some of that equipment it really kind of shifted my um you know my direction musically and where i wanted to go especially with the modular stuff when i got the 2600 and the ems synthy those those synths were really really um um you know, just groundbreaking and and just really really kind of you know, change my perspective on what, uh, even how to approach synthesis and, and sound shaping in general. And, you know, going back to the ARP 2600, um, that was such a great synthesizer to begin with because that really, really teaches you the basic fundamentals of, you know, almost every building block that I still use today, you know. And you see everything, you really see the signal flow on top of it and how it, yeah, I have one myself, it is, and it sounds, Amazing. I remember when I had mine, I, it took me about two or three days to get a sound out of it because I wanted to patch wildly everything and you don't need a patch cable at all to get a sound out of it. That was, uh, yeah, an experience for it. But it's an amazing machine. Love it. Especially, Especially that you see everything and can really follow the signal flow. That's the signal path. Yeah, that's exactly the same. It, it, it is a very educational playground to learn on and to understand like basic concepts like you know, cross modulation between two oscillators. You know, I never had a synthesizer up until that point that that even would show me what that concept was. But back then when I was, you know, 16, 17 years old, I was like, oh, if I bring up this fader and this one, and then, 
this sine wave goes into this, you know, to the input. Yeah. Of this wave. <laughs> it, it creates this sound and, um, you know, there's, you know, everything from ring modulation to what a sample and hold was, a noise generator, yeah, yeah. lag processor, what, what do all these things do by themselves, but then what do they do within a bigger, uh, you know, bigger system where you're using them all together in a chain. So, you know, like you said, um, it's a very educational, it's a, it's a really wonderful system to learn on. And for me, like, you know, I don't know if I'd even be doing what I am today. I've had it, but not been for that synthesizer because it really, really set the, um, you know, set the groundwork for me to kind of mm -hmm. keep building from off of that. And I still have my, my original 2600 from that. Oh, wow. um, so it's, it's been here all these years and, um, and it still works. I had it, actually, I had it, uh, Phil Sirocco at CMS. He's a, uh, he's a guy who does, um, modifications and repairs to, um, vintage odysseys and avatars and arc 2600s and 2500s. And I'd sent mine to Phil to have mine completely, you know, all, yeah, I had to, all I had the same with, with mine. I had to one, one time I had to uh, give it to uh, clean it up and everything and all the faders and yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Once so in a while, you have well. to do that. <laughs> wow! Yeah, and then from from the ARP and the EMS and all those machines, you the next step was at some point to get to the Eurorack world, or how that did that, yeah. that connection? Yeah, the connection. It was actually through a friend of mine named Josh K. He's a, one of my best friends. Um, we uh, we've worked, yeah, for almost 20 years. I worked with them with their record label schematic records, putting out music with them and also helping them master and mix a lot of the CD compilations and stuff that we, we, we released in the late nineties. Um, yeah, we had a pretty good little thing going on for about 13 years. Um, you know, and, uh, Josh was always looking for new stuff to use in the studio. And, uh, he was the first one to make the jump into buying two Dofer cases. And I remember uh, I flew down to Miami to his studio and said, like, hey, Rich, you, you got to check out, you know, I just, I spent a couple months saving up and I built up two Dofer cases. He had two G6 cases of stuff filled up and he had like carefully planned every little component, every module in the system. And I remember we, uh, we ate a bunch of mushrooms one night and we played until God, I, I want to say we were in there for like 13 hours. I remember I, I came there on my flight lane. We went straight to the studio. We, I mean, we had dinner and then we went straight to the studio. And then I remember we left. We like came out of the, the studio. I remember it was like 10 o'clock the next day. It was like, oh my God. <laughs> we went into this like this, you know, vortex. And I remember just looking at Josh and I was like, wow, this is, this is a really compelling system because Josh had does what was so interesting to me at, at that time, which no other synthesizer would have allowed us to do was you were, you basically start out with an empty case and then you buy each component of that system. You design it exactly to the way you want it to be. I'd never had any sort of um, hardware based synthesizer that allowed me to do that. Um, the only thing that I was able to do that in was, you know, things like Max MSP or Reactor or things that were in the computer or what I was doing with the Nord uh, modular where I would build these patches and then send them to the hardware and then assign all the, you know, macros and knob assignments and button pages to, to the synth. Um, so that to actually have a, a real physical system that was all true analog um, you know, modules and circuitry that you could arrange in any order and configuration that you wanted to was really at that time in 2005 for me was groundbreaking. I was like, wow, this is really interesting. This is, this is something I, th I think is going to be really, really, uh, really great for us as far as uh, having a system that can grow with us as we keep learning in new things. And then we can adapt and change out different modules. And if we get tired of one configuration, we can just re-switch the configuration to do something completely different for a whole different application. Maybe you wanted to do more sound design stuff. Maybe you wanted to do, you know, signal processing, effects processing. Um, maybe just have it be a drone machine. Maybe have it be a sequencer to sequence other things. It, the, in the sky was the limit. It really was, um, the concept was just so groundbreaking for me at that time. Um, you know, coming from 
uh, using synthesizers that are, have always been, had a fixed interface or that you couldn't really change. You know, maybe you could change things through uh, how things kind of behave underneath the hood with like a mod matrix or something where you're making assignments uh, you know, within uh, within the synth itself, but nothing where you could actually change the the actual components of the system, like with the Eurorack. So that really, really kind of um, appealed to me, and that's why mm -hmm. I kept going. And um, eventually, started we started making lots of music with these systems, and then our system started to grow. And then, like I said, at that at that point in time, we started to meet up with some of these manufacturers. These early, uh, very early on that were sending us stuff because there wasn't many people in the United States uh, playing with this stuff um, or had an understanding of the stuff. And um, yeah, sure, there were there were definitely other composers at the time, I remember, um, that were using some Dofer stuff. But like I said, it wasn't, um, it was kind of, you know, you would go to their studio and they'd be like, oh, what is that, you know? And then yeah, the conversation kind of ended after a few minutes and they were really kind of <laughs> interested in modular stuff back then. <laughs> Um, you know, at least a lot of my friends were, they were more interested in finding like 909 drum machines and, you know, Prophet 5s and all the big glamoury kind of like poly analog keyboards, Jupiter 6s or those sort of things, you know, modular stuff was just kind of a mystery. Um, but yeah, like I said, I kind of kept going with it, just kind of sparked that. And it, like, I was just, had that really... I don't know how to explain it. It just really sparked my imagination. And you know, I kind of was like, this could go somewhere. I feel like this whole concept could be really interesting musically, what you could do with it. And, you know, as it grew, we were starting to um, come up with some really, really crazy stuff. Um, you know, even in the beginning, I remember using Dieter Dofer's modules like the 107 morphing filter and uh, the BBDs. I had like six BBD bucket brigade delays and <laughs> I think I had them all. And uh, I was doing really <laughs> weird stuff like making car plus strung drum beats with just you know, bucket brigade delays and just all kinds of strange, cool things that I that to even do that kind of stuff, even in a computer back then would have been like choking, you know, the processing power, but to be able to do it and have like, direct physical um, interactive, you know, manipulation of all the parameters in real time, you know, and, and have that just instant feedback was just completely um, just, you know, bl mind blowing to me. Mm. And, you know, even now where, where, where things are at, I think it's, it's even gotten crazier. You know, now the modules are so complex. Now they're like little supercomputers that are in some of these digital modules that I have that can do, very complex, sophisticated things just even on their own. Um, and then you, you know, put dozens of those things in different cases and then patch those together. And then you have this network of, 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 of activity of all these things and interactions happening that can create a, a pretty interesting, I don't even know what to call it sometimes. Sometimes it creates <laughs> stuff and, and I stand back and I'm going, I don't even know what the fuck is happening right now. <laughs> but I'm going to just hit record <laughs> <laughs> quickly. <laughs> you know, um, and, that's and how, how do you, uh, just a quick, quick uh, question um, in between, how do you, w when you start composing a track, do you, do you have a plan in your head, like uh, how the end result should sound or, or do you go with one sound and then layer the other sounds on top of it or, do you only have a concept or how, how can I imagine you starting uh, to create a track? Yeah, that's uh well, yeah, I guess for me, um, yeah, like when I said, it's going back to 2016, I made a, I set a goal for myself. I was like, okay, I'd spent many, many mo months planning and building this system. Then I was like, all right, I'm going to, I want to design and build a set of cases to be able to sit down and write music every night after I've like finished my client work at the end of the day, I want to be able to like sit down and be able to like fairly quickly come up with things, um, you know, efficiently fast program things. If I have an idea, I can just sit down patch up stuff within maybe like 20, 30 minutes, get something happening. Um, that was my goal just for myself. So I started researching and I spent months and months, putting together these cases where I was like, okay, these two cases are going to be specifically set up for generating rhythms. 
Um, then I have another two cases that would do like melodies and they would also, um, in each case would have its own sequencers in it. So I could, I could clock sync them all together. So my plan was to, um, at least even for the last step my last album, this is the approach I took was I used, um, probably about five to six cases of stuff and they would all share the same clock, but you wouldn't necessarily hear all five cases at the same time. You might hear two cases be running for maybe like the first two minutes of the track. And then I'd have a segue or a section where it would switch to a different part of the song where you would distinctly hear maybe different sounds playing or a different section or a movement that would happen for another two to three minutes. And that would be another two cases of, uh, of stuff. And then, you know, by the four or five minute mark, I would have another transition point where maybe there'd be just some sounds breaking. I have some samples and drones or whatever um, that would be ready. It would all share the same clock, but it would just be different movements, different sounds. That was the only way that I was able to achieve um, creating this long evolving piece of kind of share the same vibe and movement and tempo, but I was able to switch how the tr track would transform over time without mm -hmm. it always sounding very stagnant. Cause like in the beginning I would use maybe one case and to me, maybe it would sound interesting for about 20 or 30 minutes and then I would get bored of it. I was like, ah, oh, I need some new sounds. I need, I need for this, this composition to go somewhere. I needed to go from this point, but I wanted to go from that point and travel through all this stuff to get to this point. That's a completely different place from where we were at the beginning. And so, my approach for dealing with that was just to use multiple cases of stuff and then each one, uh, you know, would play different parts in, in, in the composition. So that's how I tackled that. And I still kind of uh, approach that in the same way here with um, all the new stuff that I have. And I know a lot of people that see my videos sometimes are like, you know, I'm only hearing like eight or nine things in this patch you've got going and you've got all this stuff patched up. And, um, but I do I do a lot of different things. So I, I have probably at any given time in here, like right now I have about five different patches running at the same time. Mm -hmm. and all of them don't necessarily have anything to do with each other, just like ideas that I've started and then that I've stopped or maybe I've run into like a creative block where I'm like, okay, let me just mute this patch out. I'll come back to it when I'm in a different headspace and then I'll work on something else. Um, so I, I generally have like five or six different patches where I have different ideas, different things going on. And then I kind of just work on them until I get to a point to where I feel like there, there's something cool. And then I'll add maybe another case or two, and then I'll finish it out into an actual song, uh, composition or record out for mm -hmm. that night. Um, but I'm always experimenting and trying, um, something new. Uh, One you know, can hear that you, you love to, uh, dive deep, I guess, into, every technology and that's what one can really hear in everything you do in every preset um uh, preset programming or any sound you're doing that that's what i love about your sound the most the really diving deep experimenting and exploring every little thing about it that's really amazing um one more question about the album: Did you um, did you mix it in your case, or uh, did you do do the mixing um, in the in your DAW, or how did you do that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, uh, I have uh, a couple of the if you guys are familiar with the NW2S um, modules, they basically take um, like I think I had the 016. I think that's what called this. Um, it's uh, it takes like balanced uh, 16 inputs and then converts that to a DB25 cable that I run oh, out. Mm -hmm. um, I have two of those. Um, and what that does is it allows me to kind of break out each individual signal that I can oh, get nice. as a stem. So 16, I have two of those, so I can do up to 32 channels. And then I have two Apollo 16 X's that I have linked up here that those feed into um, in my rack back here on the bottom. So those also accept 25, uh, they're 25 dB connectors going to the back. So what I do is when I get the patch to a point to where I was like, all right, I want to record this. Um, I just basically just take my, you know, I separate stuff out, kick drum, snare drum, hi hats, 
Um, I try to separate as much stuff as I can possibly can. So when I take the stems and I mix them, I can try to mix them and give everything its own space to live in so that you get a lot of clarity. Um, in, and also I'm really picky about the definition and how detailed the sound is and the depths of the reverbs and the spaces and everything. So um, mm -hmm. I just spend a lot of time tweaking those things to try to get them to where they sound, I guess, right to my ears. And then, um, yeah, I captured the computer is just basically like a tape recorder, if you want to say, or mm -hmm. a, a digital multi-track recorder. And then I take those stems and then I'll, uh, mix those through, uh, I have a couple of the dangerous music, um, summing mixers. So they're basically just analog summing mixers that take your stems and you can mix them through. You get a lot of really nice headroom. You can push them really hard. Um, and then several of those, uh, have inserts. So I have an insert out where I can send it to another lunchbox of different modules that I can do more processing with, uh, various outboard EQs, um, and compressors and, um, just more recently, I've been using a system um, by a Canadian company called uh, Flock Audio, and it's called the system called the Flock Audio Patch, which it's pretty been a big a big game changer for me. Uh, it's mm -hmm. 32 ins and outs in a rack module, so it's it's like a virtual patch bay that's controlled by software connected to your computer. Mm -hmm. so you can route all of your external uh, outboard gear into this box and then reconfigure it in any combination with the click of the mouse. Really? Uh -huh. yeah. wow. So what's really great about it is all my ex uh, external outboard gear here, like my manly compressors or my API stuff, um, I can just simply drag, the, drag them out into any chain that I want in any order. I can run them in parallel or I can uh, I have mid-side processing chains that where I could run them into a mid-side processor. I can also molt signals. I can take a signal and molt it across multiple channels to run it through different pieces of hardware just to get different um, variations of stems to hear what different, you know, which which combinations working best. It's almost just like uh, using the hardware like plugins in a way. Um, that's cool. So it's uh, it that's been really interesting, and you can also use it. Um, to process stems because it's place it has 32 physical outputs. I can reconfigure and switch the output. Um, you know, pull one of my. Uh, I have an extra DB25 cable back there. I can repull that out of one of my Apollos and switch the order and have my um, either my two Convar eights playing 16 channels in through the summing mixer, or I can have it play out of the uh, Flock Audio patch into you know, 32 channels and have each channel have one of my, any of the, I don't know, dozens of different outboard pieces of equipment here to hear uh, which ones work best. Like I use like the Poltec EQs a lot for drums and my API 2500 compressor for my drum bus. And um, there's just so much stuff here that, but just having the flexibility to route it anyway, and then being able to throw them on an entire mix anywhere I want on any of the stems has been a, a, a real game changer. So mm, that's amazing. I've been doing that for the, the new, I'm working on a new record right now. Oh, and cool. Two hours of music I've got recorded so far. So it's a lot of material. I don't know how I'm going to put it out. Um, but uh, it's, uh, and I have another record that's going to be coming out very, very soon that we've just oh, nice. mm -hmm. pressing plant. That's a, it's a new acid record. Uh, that I've been working on, been doing a lot of work with these TB303, modified 303 mm -hmm. stuff, and uh, but not like your typical acid record. This one's a bit more abstract. I've not really heard anyone make acid music like this. So I'm really excited to put this out and see how it, uh, I've played a couple of live shows. I've done three shows with this acid setup where I played some of these tracks out live and they went off really, really well in a live context. So. I was like, all right, I think I should try to put these out on a record. These would be really good to, to have. Um, yeah, nice. Soda. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, they came out pretty interesting because it was a hybrid. It was the tracks we're using, maybe three or four three or threes, and then two modular cases and maybe like a TR-8S drum machine. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of like glitchy abstract rhythmic stuff, polyrhythmic stuff happening, and then a lot of the 303s are being processed and all kinds of weird stuff. So there was um, a lot of really interesting things happened. Um, and so I'm really excited to get this record out um, 
fairly soon. So hopefully, oh, nice, nice. The, the the you know the COVID nineteen virus. Hopefully, when this this all passes over and the pressing plant opens up again, we'll be able to get this record out the door. But right now, they've been uh. Oh, they're, they're closed too. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're closed. We uh, we tried to get it in before they uh, they mm. shut all operations down, but we we didn't make the. Um, <laughs> we damn didn't make it. <laughs> uh, oh, that's that's crazy. I I hope too that it's happening soon. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So uh, it's already been an hour. I don't know if you have a little bit maybe more time for because we got so many <laughs> questions from uh, from our community and maybe just a few more from them because the questions now were <laughs> uh coming from from me and the sound and recording team so if you have a little bit more time maybe uh, yeah no totally yeah the kids they and, uh, haven't come back yet so we're <laughs> <laughs> very good <laughs> so maybe because there are really good questions uh coming in like um my favorite question from from those is uh for example what are your five desert island modules for example oh, let's see. <laughs> well i would say my first one would be the er301 i think a lot of oh, people yeah. in my interviews probably know that i'm a big um i rave really big about that module i think brown jackson did an amazing job on that um that to me really is uh if you really dig dig in and dive deep into that module, you can come up with some pretty strange, interesting things. Um, and I love the concept of building your own units and containers of, you know, taking these DSP block objects and creating these, you know, these patches, and then you decide how control voltages and gates are gonna interact with that, that patch that you've made. And I particularly like using it for uh, the sampling capabilities. I love using the granular samplers and, um, I do a lot of like really glitchy processed um, sliced up a lot of my drums that sound all crazy and <laughs> all over the place is actually being um, created with uh, the ER301 oh, right. and uh, that that is just such a powerful um, box if you dig in it's you know you could do you could do a whole show with just that module in itself. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I have it in my, my live case now. I'm, I'm using a much smaller setup now. I'm using just a 7U IntelliGel case, and I have that in there with two bit boxes and mm -hmm. um, I can touch sequencer, circadian rhythm, and the uh, winter modular um, sequencer as well. And uh, my the Eloquencer. Uh, the Eloquencer, yeah. Mm -hmm. Two of the Eloquencers, which are also really great. Um, and uh, while we're on the topic of, of sequencers, uh, another favorite. A sequencer of mine most recently that I've been really, really having a lot of fun with is uh, the Vector Sequencer by 512. My friend Jim Coker uh, has designed that. I have that with the expander, and I've been just coming up with just like just just the latest two firm last two firmwares that he's uh, he's uh, updated it with with the chance and probability functions have just been out of this world. Like the ryth rhythmically, what you can do with it. Um, like I, I use it primarily now just to sequence drums and just. Mm -hmm. it's out of this world what you can do um it's definitely coming up with stuff that i've not been able to get with any other eurorack sequencer um and i've been yeah i've been investigating uh other ways to sequence the modular i've now been looking and looking actually at using maybe the computer too to do sequencing with like javascript um and i'm looking at title cycles and and i'm really really fascinated by these new um uh, artists like Ren Rennick Bell and uh, William Fields, and um, there's just uh, some really interesting things happening with some of the, the, the uh, artists that are doing like live coding. Um, and Ken Ohm, this is other guy that is doing really really interesting stuff. They're they're all doing like code live code based um, sequencing, just because some of the stuff that you can do with that is just uh, it's beyond. Um, what you could do with hardware right now, as far as like, um, you know, taking these data data arrays where you could, you know, access data array of like rhythmic material and then manipulate it on the fly with just a couple of, um, you know, change a couple of bits of code or, you know, set it up with a controller. Um, I'm really, really looking, I've been looking into this a lot more. And like, for me, like, I, I really want to get more into like AI generative Environment, environment stuff where I can uh, design an engine, maybe in Max or something that's listening, mm -hmm. where I can feed it things that I like, and then it generates 
uh, you know, sequences of things that I want. So it, it takes some of the parts that are harder for me to do here, and then I can repurpose that data and use it later on. And then maybe the system can give me like 20 or 15 different permutations of something that I like. And then I can, you know, refine that even more and be like, okay, these were really good. These other ones were bad. And then you have really, you know, you reward the system. You tell it, yeah, this was mm -hmm, cool. Mm -hmm. This wasn't, but I really want to get into machine learning. Um, I think in the next phase of, I want to be able to not just learn something, but like take that data and like abuse it, like <laughs> um, manipulate that data in ways to come up with new things, um, you know, so, or maybe confuse the algorithm, like feed it five, 10 different things it doesn't even understand just to come up with something new, you know? Mm -hmm. like, I'm, I'm really fascinated with that idea moving forward. I really want to experiment with, uh, especially with like the structure and composition of, the, of a musical, like a music track um, to see what would happen, you know, just mm -hmm. to, um, you know, it could be bad. Oh, super interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just now starting to kind of dig around and kind of um, explore it at this point. So um, I'm, you know, hoping to kind of maybe get into a little bit more of that by the end of this year and start implementing that into um, you know, using that with like some of the Nord uh, modular stuff and maybe some computer uh, software and modular, uh, it'd be a hybrid of all different things to kind mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm really fascinated. It's kind of where my brain's been um, very curious about lately as far as um, kind of thinking out of the box and <laughs> it's coming up with a new way to, to, to compose, you know. Um, yes, that would would be another question as well. Where do you see music composition or the te technologies for music composition in, let's say, 50 years? Do you have any visions of it or how could it look like? Yeah, that'd be, that's fascinating. I don't know where, we'll, you know, I don't know where we'll be. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping for something where I could just connect something to my brain because I have all these <laughs> ideas all the time. And sometimes I try to get what's in my head and, and, and kind of flesh out either with, you know, working with hardware or software. Sometimes I get 80%, 20% what I had in my head, but due to the limitations or restrictions or for whatever reason, I might not get close to 100%, but maybe hopefully they have a system where in 50 years they could just plug something in. It's like, that will be so sleep. great. That's exactly <laughs> my, that's exactly my dream as well. And there are, um, actually very crude um, like you, ca you can uh, you put on a helmet and uh, it reads the electrical signal signals in um, in your head and then you can you like you have to think of just like a very uh, simple commands like left 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 and then really the the mouse wanders to the left side of your screen but it's very crude at the moment so I really hope it's maybe getting there at some point yeah, I mean that, that, that would be amazing. Right, you know, then then I could sell everything in my studio. We wouldn't do any of that. <laughs> you just plug this thing in and um because really these are all just tools at the end of the day that we're trying to convey an idea or an emotion, you know. They really, you know, that's all they really are. And a lot of people they probably look at my studio and they're like, Man, he has like all this stuff. And really to be honest with you, it's just too much. I mean, you don't need all this stuff to make music with. You really don't. Um, you know. I, I, you know, when you guys were asking me about the desert island modules, you know, I mean, they're like I said, you could do a lot of stuff with the ER three hundred one, you know, and I, I've always had a lot of people ask me what my desert island synth would be, and um, I, I, I would have to say it'd be the laptop. <laughs> if I really, if I had to take, if I couldn't take anything else with me, and I, and I, you know, I could do anything with a mouse and a computer and a pair of headphones. That's it. That's that's very true. You have the most yeah. possibilities in there, so. Yeah. I still and, it's, feel, and it's very light to to carry. <laughs> it's light to carry. I still feel it's the most. I still feel it's the most powerful instrument in the world. You know the, You know. I find it very curious as well because on stage it's quite. Um, you always have to hide it somehow these days. Yeah, it's so funny. Everyone how is using it. Actually, you know that uh, maybe it's just it's doesn't look as cool, I guess, or I don't know maybe, what. Yeah. Uh, or everyone has it at home every day uh, in front of oneself, so people don't want to see it. Maybe just on stage when they go out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I played many years out 
on laptops. It was probably, you know, you know, a good 11, 12 years where we were all doing laptop shows with uh, accession and M audio controllers and stuff like that. And uh, that's how we used to go to gigs all the time was just, you know, uh, and I, I, sometimes I miss those days, you know, now I'm traveling with like two cases of modular stuff, <laughs> stressed that I'm going to hopefully make it through security and then yeah. like, <laughs> get to the gig. And then I'm like checking my stuff an hour before to make sure everything's working. And of course there's like always something that goes wrong <laughs> during the performance. And I'm That's always like, this was never an issue when I had played on the laptop. It was like, hit the space bar and we're, we're here we go. <laughs> That's true. Though it can be also somehow challenging maybe funny if something doesn't work and and you have to repatch maybe or i don't know just improvise that yeah and so that's, that's really cool that's one interesting thing about the modular that i found that didn't happen a whole lot in the computer even when i was doing my sets with ableton i was my i was doing sets for a while when i was using um max for live i had this huge max for live uh session that's you know it's like i think i had like 600 and or 500 clips, I could play for hours in there. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And then I had that synced up with like a, an electron machine drum, mono machine. And uh, I think I was starting to use the Octatrack at the end too. And, but even the Octatrack, you could just do a whole show on an electron Octatrack. I was, I was really diving deep into that. Um, and then um, then after a while, I, when I started to get more into the modular stuff, what I really liked about it was the spontaneity of things going wrong. And, and when sometimes when they would go wrong, something so cool would happen. You'd be like, holy cow. I don't know what I did, but this is so much cooler than what I was doing. <laughs> so we're just going to, you know, ride in this pocket for, uh, for a little while and see where it goes. And that's happened to me many times playing live where, you know, I did something wrong or, I sh you know, I hit the wrong mode on one module and something happened where I was like, Whoa, that's, that's really cool. That, that would have never happened on a computer because everything's so controlled <laughs> in the environment within, within a DAW that you really, really have to, to intentionally screw up something in there. Um, you wouldn't get this sort of strange, you know, sporadic, um, things that happen within like this really dense complex patch. Like when I've done patches live, they're really dense and, you know, like one wrong steer could shift it in a whole different direction. And, um, and I love to have the control of making things extremely complex and then just being able to take one knob and just shut everything off until like maybe one element to just, you know, just one turn no matter of a, mm -hmm. of a second. I think that's really powerful to be able to do that. And that's what I love um yeah that's amazing yeah with the modular um that's so cool um another question from uh, uh one of our viewers is um what music do you find interesting at the moment is there any artist you you're digging right now oh what have i been listening to well um um gosh there's there's, there's so much weird stuff that uh, that um Man, I've been really digging the, the latest Autecker sets that were just released uh, from 2016, the One Six Tour stuff. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. I remember hearing the bootlegs of that, just thinking, it's like, oh, I'd love to hear the board recordings of those. I think those are really, um, those are what I've been playing most recently over the past few days. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think, Gershwa Lichtenberger, I'm not sure if you guys know his work. He's a German. Mm -hmm artist, uh, does, does visuals and does amazing music on the raster Neutone label. Um, ah, yes, yes, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, Great. he's been doing some just fascinating, um, it's just like brutal, beautiful digital minimalism music, um, mm -hmm. but it's uh, this just extremely gorgeous textures within his music, and I love what he does rhythmically, and and also uh, the some of the, the, the artists I was mentioning before that are doing some of this live coding music, mm -hmm. like Bell, and, um, you know, and of course, William Fields, who's also kind of designed this system with Reaper, where he's, he's built this just uh, just complete music making system on his own uh, to generate, uh, you could generate hours of music on the fly. I'm just really fascinated with all the, the music that he's been creating and this whole scene, this algo rave scene of these live coders that... Um, are making some really interesting, compelling electronic music using, they're not using modulars at all. They're basically using the Chrome web browser 
uh, using this minimal technology, um, almost nothing to to create this really really interesting electronic music. I'm, I find I find what they're doing is extremely fascinating, um, and you know I'm hoping to kind of play around with some of this myself, and and see what what I can do with some of this stuff. So um, I, I find that that to be um, very 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 uh, um, I don't know really just interesting at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. so if you guys haven't checked any of that out, you should definitely check out some of the stuff that they're doing on some of their band page, uh, band camp pages. And, and they, I believe they have quite a few SoundCloud tracks that have been um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well. Um, so that's uh, definitely something to look into if you guys are looking for inspiration. Um, you know, uh, I know that's been a big, a big one for me. Lately. Mm, nice. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, um... I hear another question. Uh, do you have a work-life balance? I guess you work pretty much so many projects that you already worked on and uh, very time-consuming, I guess. Yes, it is very time-consuming, uh, especially with two kids. I mean, I don't know how many people in the in the live chat have have children. I'm sure a few of them do, but they probably know what I go through. Especially I have a son myself, yeah. Son, so you know that Time management is important because you got to feed your kids. I mean, my schedule begins uh, six in the morning. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Every day I get up early. Yeah, I've had to invert my entire schedule from what it used to be. I used to work all night, late night, and go to bed at six in the, at six in the morning. Same here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and then now, yeah, that I have a three-year-old and then my daughter started school. She's in second grade, so I have to get her up in the morning, make sure she has breakfast and get her hair combed and have her presentable for school and get her to the bus stop by seven. And then, you know, um, and then I just start working. So I start working as soon as I take, you know, she goes to school and then I pick her up from the bus stop. And then my wife gets home from work. We have dinner, we do homework, got to put the kids into bed, <laughs> which takes a couple hours. And then <laughs> she'll, my wife will usually like retire on the couch and watch TV. And then I'll go back in the studio and work for maybe like two to three hours. Uh, before I go to bed, and that's usually how my schedule works. So yeah, my wife is, uh, or my wife and I's lives have been completely changed since the kids have, uh, you know, started school, and so we've had to kind of really work around the school schedule because that's mm. what's the most important. Um, and I experience uh, as well that uh, when, when, for myself, if I get into the studio, I can't, you know, like surf a bit or uh, get into the mood I have really or for my, myself I get in the studio and start working right away <laughs> because you have really to uh, yeah make the best of your time make yeah. best of your time of every minute then I definitely feel that every day now <laughs> <laughs> yeah because yeah usually in the morning I try to do client work first so I get the first part of the day to get the client work done and then like late at night after I put the kids to bed I'll go work on my own personal music stuff is when I do that kind of thing that's kind of how I you know separate the time um, you know sometimes it works it doesn't work out every night um, I try though I try to always do a little bit of music every night at least a couple hours of stuff that I'm working on because um, you know like I said I told myself I was like all right I'm putting it on myself to I want to at least write one track or patch up something every night and record it it might be good it might be bad but at least I have a catalog of things that I'm recording and I'm learning all the time and it's forcing me to kind of keep pushing myself to um, you know come up with new things and then the stuff that that I find is really really interesting that I felt worked really well. Then I put the in a catalog those, and then those might get released on uh, uh, the the record. And that's kind of how I've been sorting tracks for a new album. Um, so mm -hmm. it's not just stuff that's all going to waste. It's actually trying to uh, you know just source some of the best material to get ready to put out another release. And, Great. Great. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I've definitely got a you know like I, I think I mentioned earlier before I got about two hours worth of new material that. Um, then I want to release it just to figure out what order it'll go in. I don't I haven't even call. I don't even know what I'm going to call it. I haven't named any of the tracks or anything, but got a pretty interesting collection of stuff that's that I would love to share with everyone. That's pretty much ready to grow to go. So yeah, I'm very excited to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe um, now it's already 
one hour and 20. Wow, um, time flies. Uh, maybe our last question. Um, you mentioned earlier that many of your friends, um, the, the main question, the, the question you hear most often was uh, how to get into mod into the modular world, what to get when, when one wants to start off. What would you recommend? Yeah, that's that's a great question. That's um, you know, like I mentioned before, that's one question that I get asked quite often through private messages or direct you know, messages on Instagram or whatever. Um, you know, hey, I want to get into modular. What would be a good way to get in? I don't know what to buy. I've never had a system before. Um, you know, a lot of my friends that were getting into this come from computer backgrounds where they make music completely in a DAW environment and um, so this was completely alien to them, and a lot of them don't didn't want to have to piece together a system. Actually, I find that interesting. A lot of them wanted to just start out on a system that was already pre-configured for them so they could learn the basic concepts, which I think, as I started mentioning with the ARP 2600, that's how I started. I worked out what a system that had fixed modules and then learned the basics. So I think that's a great approach is to maybe look for a system um, that's set up that way. And one in particular that I feel is, is really great is the make noise shared system. Um, and there's other systems out there in a Pittsburgh modular has theirs and, you know, um, tip top, they have their stuff and they're all aimed at tackling different compositional approaches to working on music. But I really, really feel that Tony's make noise shared system is really, re a really great place to start because he has just the right combination of elements in his system where you can learn about synthesis, you can learn about sampling, you know, you can learn about modulation, amplitude, ring modulation, frequency modulation, um, you know, the basics and, and even more complex issues are all kind of packaged in the system and you kind of just work at your own pace and just kind of like take one piece at a time um, to kind of like grasp each module and then start patching into, uh, into bigger things. And and uh, I also think they do a really, really great job of explaining how to use their stuff. They have a very active Instagram and YouTube channel where they're constantly showing you new ways um, to use their modules. I love all of Walker. He's one of the employees at Make Noise. He does a lot of their online YouTube videos on how to patch up using some of the Make Noise modules uh, for you know various different applications to get different sounds. Um, and uh, they're always coming up with really inventive ways to kind of always keep your interest peaked. Of like, oh, wow, I never thought to use this module this way. Oh, so you get excited to go back and use that and, and try it out in a music track or use it in, um, for some of their application. But I always feel that they're, they're, doing, they're all doing a great job of not only selling a great product, but also making sure they have a lot of educational content to keep you interested in learning about how to use these instruments. So um, I often tell people to, to take a, a really good hard look at the uh, shared system um, as maybe a first purchase or as a first dive into the, the Eurorack module. Or I actually have a, a shared system myself here too that I still use all the time. Uh, I still think it's Great. Even at my level of, of, of working, it's still a great system to get new stuff out of that even surprises me to this day. Um, so I feel that that would be a great place to a great place to start if you were interested uh, in pursuing um, making music with this stuff. Great advice. Yeah, that's a beautiful system. Yeah. I'm a, myself a big fan of Make Noise and uh, the modules and the concepts behind it. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for your time and the great um, answers and insights into your work. It was very, a great pleasure meeting you. Definitely, thank you for having me. It's my first yeah. meet, my first live stream, so I... Uh, what an honor, <laughs> thank you so okay, much. But... <laughs> it was brilliant, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, I hope uh, you guys liked it too, our viewers. Um, if you have any more questions, just leave a comment for us um, and I'll have a look at it. And uh, yeah, so I'll say bye for tonight. <laughs> bye. Cheers. You guys have a good one. <laughs>